Thank you, Minghui. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Danny. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to share with you all this morning. The title is Jealous God. Yeah, by a jealous speaker, perhaps. <laughs> now, just now during the praise and worship, I felt that God was uh, saying something very important to me. I felt that God was saying to me that, my son, you have to focus on me. Not on yourself, not on others, not on the situation. For there are no answers to be found in any of these places. There will only be problems. And I felt that this is something that is so fundamental, you know, focusing on Jesus. We hear it a lot in the church. I, for one, have heard it so many times. But I think that God wants me to bring me to another level of really in all situation, in all circumstances, to just look to Jesus for the answer. So I really amen the, the last song that we sang. And I also really amen whatever uh, Brother David was sharing just now during his his uh, this uh, sharing for the the Holy Communion. You see, uh, I I, I want to go to the to the end. <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. okay, okay. Now, this Hebrews chapter twelve, it uh, Paul tells us, or rather the writer tells us, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are these witnesses? These are the witnesses to God's work in their lives. These are the witnesses to God's leading. What it means, right? These are not the witnesses that, if you look at the full context, if you look at the chapter before it, these witnesses, right, does not refer to the people that watch us running. That's what I used to think when I was very young. But when I read it again, I realized that if, if we look at the context, most likely it refers to Chapter, uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the, what they call the, the, the heroes of faith. Their hall of fame, you know, where, where, where the writer lists out all these people that follow God in faith. And to me, the, the summary was that in their lifetime, they did not receive what was promised. But still they look forward, having the full confidence that God will give them what he has promised. And in particular, the writer talked about how Abraham moved from place to place to place. And he was looking for a city that he really belonged to, a city whose foundations are not built by human hands. So these are the witnesses that the writer is talking about. And the, so the writer is urging all of us who read it that when we consider the lives of all these witnesses of God's work and God's leading, in their lives, that we should do the same and we should run the race just as they have. Now, this is, what is this race that we, are, that we run? What is this race that I run? For what do we run it? For what do, do I run this race? If I can sum up why I do what I do, uh, why I have decided to take these decisions in my life that make me who I am today. The reason that I do what I do is that I am like the traveling, the searching pilgrim. I'm searching for something. Some people follow the Lord because God had done something very significant in their lives and they are forever thankful. There are such people. Some others are like me. We want to see. We want to see whether or not God is real. We want to discover whether or not God is really good. We want to discover whether or not Jesus is really real. And in my life now, I've seen certain things. I've experienced certain things. But to me, it is not enough. I'm searching for more and more and more. I want to see what is at the end of that race. And it's for that reason that I run it. I do not want to wait until my dying days 
before I start to ask the question, what is life all about? What will happen after I die? Is there really a God? Some, some of us, we think about these questions earlier than others, right? Some, uh, you know, they, they think too much, we call it, and perhaps I'm one of them. But I think that there will come a time where all of us will ask it. There will surely come a time where all of us will ask it, for it is a question that concerns all of us. And it is right that all of us are concerned about the answer to that question. But I do not want to wait until my dying days. I want to spend my life searching for this answer. And, but you know, as we run the race, sometimes uh, we get stuck. And we stop running for a variety of reasons. Like, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. During our prayer retreat, and this, this prayer retreat is the same prayer retreat that uh, I, I think Ming Hui was referring to. It's the same prayer retreat that uh, Auntie Anna was referring to. It's just that simple retreat. How long ago was it? A month ago or something? A month and a half ago or, or something? When the full-timers just gathered together and all we did was to pray. There was no service. Uncle Chong Hyang didn't preach to us. And we didn't have any like praise and worship uh, sessions. We didn't read any material. We really just came down to the basic. And we just sat down and we just prayed in tongues. Because we expect that God will speak to us personally. And I think that though by right, uh, when you don't have all these things and you are just in a place somewhere, then there's no other stimulus by right. Can God really move? Because we're so used to like God moving when there's music or God moving when there's a good speaker or God moving when there's someone that's anointed praying for us or God moving when there is this or when there is that. But will God really move when it's just me sit down somewhere and I just pray? But we came with the expectation that God will move in us and God really did. And that session, I think it really spoke to all of us. We all took something back that was very crucial to our individual lives. For me personally, one of the important things that I felt God told me was that as I run the race, if I really wanted to reach the end, I cannot be entangled by things. I cannot let something stop me from running or block me. And I felt that God was telling me that it was the idols in my life that entangle me. I had some idol and I was like, oh really? I never thought of myself that way, that I have idols that I worship in my life. So this is really the impetus for today's message when I talk about jealous God. Now we can go back to the beginning. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. I don't know how to toggle the... Okay, never mind. Now, jealous God. What does it mean to be jealous? Well, among other things, a jealous person will say like, will feel like, hey, you have this thing, but actually this thing should belong to me. I'm the one that deserves to have it. Probably not you. That's why a person is jealous. And uh, I understand what is jealousy. Last night, I was sharing about how I was jealous for my wife. And I will tell the story again. Um, this, uh, at one point, uh, before, after we got attached and before we got married, uh, I was hanging out at my, spending some time at my wife's place. We were just, you know, spending some time together. And it was after work. Yeah, it must have been a weekend or something it is. Uh, uh, some, I was still working in Singapore. So when you work in Singapore, right, your time is very precious to you. That's why a lot of people get very angry at the checkpoint. They get very angry queuing up because we're all like, oh, not enough time for sleep, not enough time for family. So people working in Singapore that travel, that commute every day, right, the one thing they hate, they hate a lot would be don't waste my time. So I had taken up that time to spend with my girlfriend, because obviously she's very important to me. It's, to me, it's like protected time, you know. Nothing should interrupt it. But in the middle of our time together, 
suddenly the phone rang. Not my phone, but her phone. And she like kind of picked it up. Now I expected that I just pick up, oh, okay, whatever it is, okay, I'm busy now. Let me call you back later. But no more. The conversation went on and on and on. Wow, it was very long. I think like 20 minutes to half an hour. And over there, I was just stewing in anger. Like, what is this woman doing? What's wrong with her? And then, right, as she, as she spoke on the phone, I can hear who she's talking to. She is talking to her boss from work. I'm like, what is this? Your, bo- your boss pays a salary. So fine, he can call you when, um, when it's during office hour. But now, what time is it? Hey, guys, it was very late. It was not 6 o'clock. It was not 7 o'clock. It was not 8 o'clock. It was more like 9, 10 o'clock. Wow, if your boss call you at that time, uh, he better have a good reason or he better be paying you a lot. <laughs> well, in that case, it was neither. So I was very jealous. And after the she hang up, I said, why you put your boss above me? It's like, no, uh, never. Uh, he called me, uh, so I have to like respect and like listen to what he say. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, no, he's just telling me some of the ideas he have. I'm like, why he cannot wait? I felt so jealous because that time is mine. The girl is mine, not yours. <laughs> this is jealous. <laughs> now, why is the title Jealous God? Do you know that in Exodus chapter 20, God says that uh, you shall not bow down to, to them, the idols, or worship them. God is speaking to the Israelites, to his people. He says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Oh, so actually, God also is jealous. But God's jealous is not the same as human jealousy. Sometimes right, we are jealous because we are possessive because we're insecure. But God was jealous for the Israelites because the Israelites went to worship other idols instead of worshipping Him. That meant that they loved the other idols above God. And to God, this is like, it's wrong. It's wrong because the people are supposed to worship me. Now, let's look at uh, Psalm 81, which I have touched upon in my previous sermon and sometimes when I come out to promote the camp or whatsoever. Psalm 81, I think we get like uh, insight into like, it's like God's feelings are put into words, you know. I heard an unknown voice saying, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. This is addressing the Israelites. In your distress, I called you. Uh, uh, you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. And you know, those who know, who, who know your Bible a bit, a bit well, you will know that most likely this refers to the Israelites' time in Egypt. When they were second class, third class, they were like the, the, the workers, they were just exploited by the 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 people of that country to be like free labor and they were suffering and they cried out to the Lord for help and God really rescued them did all the miracles went against the Pharaoh of Egypt and Egypt was one of the most advanced nations in the world at that time if not the most advanced or at least in that part of the world and so God really delivered them from Egypt and God provided for them in the desert and God appeared to them. And then here, the psalm continues, Hear me, my people, and I will warn you. If you would only listen to me, Israel, you shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not worship any god other than me. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will feel it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. If my people would only listen to me, 
If Israel will only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord will cringe before Him and their punishment would last forever. But you will be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Now, why was I jealous for my wife? The reason is this. The boss was not good for her. The boss actually, right, uh, now, especially now, the more we look back, the more we look at that season of her life when she gave her time, her resources, her energy, her attention to this person to the point where we can say that almost her life revolved around this boss. When we counted the cost and when we counted the benefit, then we realised that actually it's really a loss. On so many levels, following this man was a loss. And I knew it. And that's why I was angry that at that point in time that she was still talking and she was still like letting this guy like take all her time. I knew it. Even at that point in time in our relationship, I already knew it. But, and to me it's like, look, the guy, uh, he's not going to die for you. He only makes use of you because he has a target. There's something that he wants to build with his life. He wants to build his business. You are a very useful tool to him. No more, no less. So what for you want to give your life to a master like this? Better you follow me, your husband, right? Because surely I will take care of you. Yeah, And you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> The Bible tells us that the husband, right, is supposed to give up the life for the wife, just as Christ gave up his life for the church. And so, right, I felt that no matter, uh, yeah, I know I'm not perfect, but surely I'm better than this guy you're following. This is not a perfect example, but it gives us like, a, like a, an analogy, like an analog to how the relationship between God and Israel and why God is jealous for the Israelites. Because, right, what benefit did the idols bring to Israel? Except to lead them into sin. When Israel went after the idols and Israel struggled with idolatry for so long, we're talking about hundreds of years, they struggled with just they cannot decide whether they want to worship God solely or whether they want to like be like a two-timer or a three-timer or a four-timer. And But God is like, these idols, they do nothing for you. But God, God says that I'm so good to you. I will surely protect you. I'll give you the best. I have the best plan for you. And I, and late, and I will even willing to give you my son. And Romans chapter 8 tells us, if he who did not spare his own son for us, how will he not also give us all other things? And so that's where God is coming from when he says he's jealous for his people. His people should belong to him and his people should look to him and worship him only because only he will take care of them. The idols, they are not. Jesus says in John chapter 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Like what we, we said during the camp, when Satan comes to us, right, he does not come like as Satan, as the scary monster, as like when you know, when you watch the horror movie, that kind of devil. Satan comes, he masquerades as something that is attractive to us. So when Israel worshiped those idols, they are attracted to it and they think that those idols would be of benefit to them, would bless them. But those idols are actually Satan in disguise. And Satan only has one purpose, to steal, kill and to destroy. So God knew that if the Israelites were to follow the idols, their life would just become worse and worse and worse and worse. 
Whereas if they were to follow God, their life would just become better and better and better. Brothers and sisters, like I shared during uh, the last message, message on obedience, many Christians think that God is out to restrict us, that God is out to restrain us, that God is here to make our life like smaller, more narrow. Actually, right, that is what Satan does instead. Do you know that in the Old Testament, there is one thing that God was really unhappy about with regards to these idol worshippers. Some of the idol worshippers, the idols or the teaching around the idols teach them that you must sacrifice your own children. And so there were even kings during that time, Israelite kings, that sacrificed their children literally in order to gain the favour of the idol. And God is like, hey, the children are a gift from me to you, you know. The children are so precious. You kill your children for this thing. Ah. And God is like outraged. So sometimes we think that it's harmless, but it's not. The Israelites must have thought that it's harmless, but it's not. And that's why God was jealous for His people. He wanted to get His people back to Him. Why did Israel run after the idols? Like I said, they must have thought that uh, the idol can give them something that maybe God cannot give. They must have felt that they would derive certain benefit from it. Maybe it's something that they really want that will give them some form of pleasure. Maybe it is something that they think they require for survival. And that's why they run after those idols. You know, um, so years ago, I went on a mission trip with the youth. At that time, I was very young. And in that mission trip, it was in Thailand. We went to a village and the, the, um, we had a, a, like a gospel rally at night in the village. But in the afternoon, we went around to go and tell the villagers that we're doing this. Please turn up at this field and we're going to like, you know, sing songs and like do some drama to entertain you all. And so many people came that night. And so we just did our thing. And then, right, at one point in the rally, we wanted to pray for the sake of one, or rather, you know, we are, we are not so bold, okay? The, the missionary wanted to pray for the sick and he said, okay, we're going to pray for the sick. So we all, okay, we just, we just tried to pray. So the, they invited people to come out, those who are not well. So this auntie came up, this old lady came, came up. I, I forgot what her issue was, but her issue is like obvious, like you can see the issue. It's not like a, like a headache. You know, like when you go to the doctor and say, I got a headache. Doctor, she doesn't know whether I got a headache. You just kind of, you got to go by what you say. But for this auntie, right, you, you, you can see the problem. So she came out and we're all very scared, but we all just kind of surrounded and prayed for her. We hope that our combined prayer power will kind of heal her. We just, anyhow, like, okay. Now, the interesting thing is that she really was healed. And the whole team was amazed. They were like, hey, what happened? Because we, we never see such things. And, and then, right, after she was healed, we were all excited. And then we popped the question. Will you marry? No, it's not. The question, <laughs> we popped the question. Will you accept Jesus? Guess what the lady said? The auntie said, thanks, but no thanks. Said, thank you for the healing but I will not accept Jesus. I would like to go home and continue to worship my gods. The team was shocked. One team member was even outraged. You see, how can this auntie be so ungrateful? God has already done something miraculous for her. The idol got do meh. And then, how can she just like, you know, you like hit God's hand away? That is like a picture of idolatry. Like you receive the blessing from God, but maybe that's not enough for you and you still feel like you've got to go back to these things. So you kind of just, you know, exist 
in these two worlds, you kind of try to two time and get the best of both worlds. When, when we come back to idolatry, so what is idolatry? I, John Piper says that idolatry is something or even a person that is loved more than God, that is wanted more than God, that is desired more than God, that is treasured more than God, that is enjoyed more than God. So when God says, you belong to me, worship me only, which basically means love me only, then when we say, I cannot, I, I can love you some, but I need to love this other thing also, that means that we love this thing more than God. Lah. Right? Imagine for the average person here, you got a wife, you got a husband, and of course your wife and husband wants you to be, ex- want to be exclusive to you and want you to be exclusive to him or her. Right? But imagine you say, I love you a lot. I will do a lot of things for you. But in my heart, I also reserve this place for this other woman. You don't mind, right? Do you think the wife would say, yeah, it's okay. La. I can see how much you love me already. I can. I can. Maybe if the wife is really desperate, okay. But the average wife or the husband, that's not good enough. You mean you love this other woman more than me? That's how it's going to come out. So, why did the Israel run after idols? They felt that the idol can give them something. Likewise today, we also have idols. The idols do not just refer to like the other religion that we can worship. It doesn't just refer to like, you know, a lot of people are very concerned when I go and do the, the Qingming, where I go and uh, visit the graves of my loved ones or my parents, whatever it is, right? And if let's say my family, they are not Christian, they are Taoist or whatever it is, then can I offer the joystick? We are very concerned about whether or not these outward actions will like defile us, whether it will displease God because it's like we are worshipping another idol. But you know, this idolatry, it goes deeper than that. It is not just the outward action of worshipping another God. It's not an action, but it's a heart issue. Because right, when in our heart, we choose to hold on to something that we think we need, and want or want above God, that is idolatry today. That is the modern idol. So if you go back to the example of my wife, why my wife, she knows Jesus and she loves Jesus and she also knows me and she knows that I love her and I'll take care of her. But why she still allow herself to revolve her life around the boss? Well, basically for two reasons. She felt that in the earlier days, she felt that this boss, right, is the key to her success. She felt that this boss, right, would would lead her to that success and glory in the world that she felt she deserved, that she felt that she greatly desired in her heart, that she felt that would make her very happy in life. Later on, as time went by, as God continued to work in her life, she began to shift her focus from like worldly pleasure. For that is fleeting. All things in the world will pass away, right? And then she began to realize more and more, I need Jesus. Jesus is the one that satisfies me. But even then, right, she could not, like in her heart, right, she cannot cut off from the boss entirely because of the second reason. She felt afraid to lose his support because without him, cannot survive. Really. She felt that if this boss, I don't have the favour of this boss, right? What am I going to do? How am I going to support myself and my family? What about the debts that we have? And so on and so forth. And so she felt that she wanted the success and the glory at first. And later on, she felt that she needed him for survival. That is an idol. Do you know Ah, uh, this I, I didn't talk about this last night. I had no time. But when we got married, right, we didn't have the engagement ring. Okay, we didn't want to waste money. Like, well, I didn't want to waste money. I'm sure she would have happily accepted two diamond rings. 
Uh, but I said, let's be, uh, let's let's do something more interesting. So we did like a, like a dog tag, you know. You get a small, and then you got like a chain and all that. And we 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 put Bible verse on it. I of totally forgot that I had this thing, you know, until she pulled it out to show me. Uh, just a couple of weeks back, I said, oh yeah, we did this, uh. And then she chose one verse for me and put it, uh, and engrave it the reference on on the dog tag for me that I was supposed to wear. And I chose one for her. And this was the one that I chose for her when I prayed for her. Because I wanted her to know that in this life, you cannot depend on anyone. And to an extent, cannot even depend on me, your husband. I cannot be your God. And that all these people, one day they'll disappoint you because they are, we are all imperfect and I wanted to her to remember that she must always trust God above all. So she was struggling. Should she trust God? Should she not trust God? And the idol in her life, it made her stuck. Now, likewise, today, in our hearts, do we have any idols? Do we have anything that we are scared to give up. Could it be that in this season of your life that God has been speaking to you that you need to give up something? You find it very difficult to give it up for a variety of reasons. We all have good reasons, well, I won't say good reasons, we all have our own reasons for struggling to give up something. God's response to the Israelites is the same response to us, which is, what can the idols give you that I cannot? In fact, right, if you just were to take out that I cannot, what can the idols give you? Question mark. It's a good question in itself. I think that's why when you look at Psalm 81, so God contrast or God reminds, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that gave you water from the rock at Meribah. I'm the one that spoke to you out of the thunder. And then, right, when God says that you are supposed to worship, uh, we're supposed to worship God only, then God says, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. So God is emphasizing in that psalm that He's not a stingy God. He's a providing God. And He's a God that provides richly. So why, we, so why can the idol really give us something that God cannot? Surely it's because we didn't focus on God. Or we are not convinced when we hear that God really can provide. Maybe we agree intellectually but in our heart, there is still that bit of disagreement and that causes us to hold on to something. So I, I really thank God that when, when my wife struggled, struggled, struggled with this area of her life and when we got married, then God allowed the boss to kind of really cut off my wife and just like, no, my wife was no longer having his favour. And so she was so disappointed and she was so sad. Uh, she, it's not because she missed the guy, but it was because, right, she felt like, what have I, what's going to happen? What about all the things that I've worked so hard for? And she was worried about many things. But because of the, the callous way in which the boss did it, my wife saw once and for all that the idol really was not for her. That only God was for her. So since then, she has been discovering more and more just how much God is for her, as we all do. And I bring up my wife's example, not to denigrate her, not to say that I'm better than her. We all go through a journey. And that's why I call myself, I'm the searching pilgrim. So now let me talk about myself. 
So, you know, recently, I was very affected by something that my friend had said to me. It was literally only just a few words on WhatsApp. My friend didn't shout at me, didn't throw things, didn't do anything, didn't crash my car, didn't do anything. Just say a few words on WhatsApp. And I was, I tell you, I was so affected for that day. I was like, oh, angry, angry, angry. How can this person say this? How can this person say this? I thought, okay, never mind. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. The next day, still angry, angry, angry. The next day, still angry, angry, angry. Just angry. I couldn't get it out of my mind. Now, the thing is this. It was really a very small remark. The person didn't say, you know, your mother, father, go and die, or whatever. Nothing like this, you know. But, and I also knew from my 20 years as a Christian, even if people call your mother, father, go and die, right? That's just them, right? They're crazy a bit. It's okay, you know. They're having their own issue. Don't they be so angry, right? Because just because they say the father, mother, go and die, doesn't mean your father, mother will die, what? Right? And anyway, my friend didn't say that. And, and some more, right? So not only I knew that I shouldn't be so affected because it's a small thing, but also my friend and I, we go way back. We have a long, positive, enjoyable friendship. Why? And, and I cannot understand. And so I, I, I know all this in my mind, but I still could not let it go. I felt so bothered by it. And, I, and, and while I felt frustrated with my friend, Actually, right, on the other side, I also felt frustrated with myself. Like, why I still cannot? Like, very, very petty, right? Do you think so? It's so petty. And, and then I realized, now I have two roads. I have two choices. The first choice is continue to hold on to the anger, to nurse it, to cultivate it, to continue to justify to myself and to others, I'm not like that. What? Why this person say this? How can this person say, you continue to give reason that you are right and the person is wrong? That's called, you continue to justify. And the problem with this is that the more you justify, the more, ang- the, the more you continue to be angry, right? It doesn't help you to be less angry. Or, so will I continue to just let it remain in my heart like a rock? Or should I surrender it? And just don't let it, just just let go of it. What really helped me to make that choice was when I realized that, you know, this year I'm 36. I'm no longer in my 20s. Like I said last night, I'm no longer Danny boy already. (laughs) Older already. Time passed by very fast, right? Look at COVID. In the blink of an eye, three, four years have passed. So in, in no time, I will be approaching 40. Once you approach 40, it's the halfway mark. And then like, am I going to spend my life letting small things like this entangle me in this race to discover God? Am I going to be angry over a small thing at 40 years old, 50 years old? 60 years old, if I hold on, how will I continue to to chase God, to seek God? Every time I worship, I'll keep thinking about the anger. It will stay with me, right? Sometimes some words, uh, it can be that one line, right? They stay with us for decades. We cannot shake it off. I said, no, I, I don't want. Because I think back about when God spoke to me about my idols. Then I realized that why I cannot let go is that because my idol is my pride. Right? People cannot say you. People cannot criticize you. This is called pride. Humble is that, yeah, let people say what they want. What God says is most important. Don't have to be so bothered by it. That's called humble. And then if people say you, you just, God, no, God, no. God, ah. okay, God, then change. Oh, don't have, ah. ah, never mind, it's okay. Proud is like, hey, you cannot say me. Uh. How can you say me like this? Who do you think you are? You know who I am. This is pride. And, and this was what God showed me, you know, the weeks before in the prayer. I felt that when God said the idols in my life, God's referring to my pride 
And in that prayer, the few weeks ago, I remember in my head, I was thinking, what has my pride ever done for me? What did my pride give me? Did my pride feed me when I'm hungry? Did I become good at my job because I'm proud? No, actually, no. The more proud I was, the worse I was at teaching. When I became humble, right, I learned a lot from my colleagues and I became better and better. Did my pride give me companionship? No. When I was younger, I had very few friends because I was very proud. People don't like to be with me. When I'm older now, I have more friends because I learned to be humble. Did, well, did my... Well, you, 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 you get my point. What did my pride ever do for me? And I realised... Nothing much. Then why do I hold on to it? Why is it so important to me that I won't let it go? Pride is like, like imagine if God asks you to apologize to Ming Hui. Then you're like, who wants to apologize to her? You know, this is called pride. So that pride stopped me from obeying God. Then I never get to experience God. And so I decide that, yes, Lord, I don't want these things to entangle me continue to show me and challenge me because the journey, running the race to discover you is a lot more important than all these things. I don't want to, on my deathbed, I think, ayah, if only I had pursued God more to like really experience God more. Ayah, you know, or I wouldn't say like, but never mind, it's all worth it because I hold on to my pride. My pride is worth it. Won't what? So, I thank God. I felt that God prompted me to send a message to my friend. So I sent a very simple message. I said, and a message I also wrote, I'm just going to move on. And I did. So it doesn't bother me anymore. And I can worship God with a clear conscience, no longer angry at my friend. Is there something that God may be asking us to put down for Him? that is important to us, but we are struggling. Struggling is normal because we are so blind to God so many times. We may feel that it's very precious and very important to us, but if it was that valuable and it was that important, God would not ask us to put it down because God does not ask us to put, it, put things down just to like test us for His pleasure. But surely, it is not good for us if we hold on to it. If we struggle, God is ever ready to help us to give it up. God is ever ready to speak to us, to say, my son, my daughter, do you remember who I am? Do you see who I am? Do you know this about me that I can provide for you? Shall we pray? God, we thank you because you come to us with such a wonderful plan. You adopt us as your children. You prepare our future for us. You prepare our present for us. You arrange our past. All things are in your hands, Lord, and you are the one above all. You are supreme, Lord. Everything is in your hands. Lord, when we struggle to give up something. Lord, we pray, please help us to see that you are really greater than all these things. It is not just positive thinking, but help us to see that it is the truth, that you are a true and living God, that you really, really can give us anything that we think our idols can give us. In fact, you will give us much more than we can imagine or expect. Lord, please help us to continue to run this race. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Uh, if you have any prayer needs, we would love to pray with you. Do feel free to come forward. All right. If not, we will see you again next week. See you.